Well, I keep looking around here, and I wish we could talk all day because I keep we seeing can. things. Okay, but a couple things I want to point out. Um, we have two um, portraits of Japanese women that are automatons, and to me, they're really, really important um, because the one on the left-hand side, the smaller one, is the classic um, Chinese tea server lady made by Lambert with a very unique face, a unique model made and used for that automaton only. And I wanted to have her standing next to the other one because when we first saw it, I thought, oh, this is an interesting example. She has a beautiful costume. It's different than they usually have. And then I said, wait a minute, it's bigger. And it is. Look how much taller it is. And the facial the model, is like similar, is not the same. It's a completely, I've never seen that model before. Very, very distinctive and an extraordinary costume. The original Biscans, I mean, it's just absolutely fabulous. And speaking of automatons, well, I made her, I think, number two in the auction, so you don't have to know how I love her, is the lady reclining on the recamier. It's funny, it's my favorite in the collection, too. Yet yeah. Up to her eyes. Yeah. And I, you have to pay attention to little details about this. Look at the fan. It has a hand-painted scene on that fan. That is so extraordinary. Everything about her is wonderful. Well, Stuart, let's talk about her relationship with the fashion designers of her time. It, it's an incredible story that we have never seen with any collector in history over the years and probably will never see again. Um, and that is her relationship with both Christian Dior, who was for many years uh, her favorite designer for her own clothing, her own clothing. and also uh, Jean Pateau and the acclaimed jewelry firm of Cartier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start with Christian Dior over here. And what is wonderful, the boy standing in the back, and we have the letters that go with the various costumes. Now, the boy on the right with the coral suit, um, she has a long correspondence with Dior telling them what she would like them to create. Now, they obviously, this wasn't their thing, but they were willing to do it because she was such a major customer. And in fact, all of the, station, the letters you have back and forth, which go with each doll, um, are great because they talk about, well, we finally found the costume and we like the fabric and we hope you'll like it. It's in French, of course. And then the next paragraph, and by the way, our new spring opening is happening next week at New York and we hope we'll be seeing you there. We have some wonderful things for you. So cl clearly they were doing this as a favor to their very, very special customer. And so she had this wonderful, and she called him Le Petit Prince. That was the costume that she commissioned, the costume called Le Petit Prince. And she loved it so much that after she had that made, then she said, could you take the same fabric that you made for the vest and make me a second jacket for him? So he has an extra jacket that goes with him. And then she liked it so much, she said, could you make me another one in a different fabric? And they wrote about how difficult it was to find these um, particular fabrics to, to make the costumes. So there were really really wonderful. Well, we're going to talk shortly about her love for the Bebe phonograph that uh, Jumeau made, but one of the thing of, of, one of the dolls has a particularly um, intriguing story because she wanted a costume made for that doll by Christian Dior. In the letters to, to um, Christian Dior, she wrote about the doll that became known between the two of them as Cantatrice, singer. Um, and they would always write about it with a capital C and in quote marks, Cantatrice, the singered costume. And here it is in this gorgeous um, blue silk, which is designed to open at the front for the exchange of the recordings. And along with that comes the letters and the correspondence concerning her commission of that costume with Dior. Which will be included with the lot for the collectors to continue on the history of these pieces. Now, Jean Patou, she had a wonderful connection with Jean Patou um, of Paris also. And we see several examples of it there. On the top is um, a very, very lovely dress with the matching hat. And as you can see, the original sketch that they presented to her to see if this would be acceptable to her for her doll. And all of the correspondence that went back and forth between the Jean Patou design firm and Huguette Clark concerning uh, the costume. I love the, the handwriting on it. But it's, it's just great. And an original box, a Jean Patou box, it's kind of hidden back there, you can't really see it. Um, that is part of it as well. On the lower shelf, 
There is another costume made by Jean Patou. By the way, I didn't say, and I should say, all of the Dior costumes and the Patou costumes have the original labels, sewn in silk labels of those designers in the costumes, Christian Dior and Jean Patou. On the bottom, we not only have the costume made by Jean Patou with a bonnet with a big feather in it, but we also have the original Jumeau costume, frail condition, which she sent to Paris for them to copy and to make an identical one for her doll. And uh, the Jean Patou hat box, that the hat came in. So a very, very great example. And then Cartier. She, was a, she owned so much Cartier jewelry herself. If those of you who followed her, um, the auction of the contents of her, of her um, home realized, of her estate condominium realized, she had much Cartier jewelry, but she commissioned Cartier jewelry for her dolls. And we have an extraordinary um, gold bracelet, gorgeous gold bracelet with turquoise flowers surrounding the bracelet and matching turquoise earrings, all the pieces signed Cartier and designed to fit a Bay Bay about size 12 or 13. Absolutely wonderful. Probably not 13 since we're thinking she didn't, she didn't have a 13. <laughs> but 12. Well, can I, I'll tell you an interesting uh, little backstory on this as well. As I talked to um, one of the uh, archivists and representatives of Cartier, and uh, they were absolutely fascinated. And I asked the gentleman who ordered the catalog to be able to have the whole background of this for his archives. Mm -hmm. um, I asked him, did you ever make doll jewelry before that mm -hmm. you could imagine? Because it's, it's even too small for a child. Right. It's clearly made specifically for a doll. He said, no, I can't say that I've ever encountered anything like that in the history of Cartier. And I said, would you have these? Well, of course, for you get anything. <laughs> yes. So that that's a you know just a wonderful story of of the, her work with designers, not only for herself, but so her dolls would be. She wore, she wore Cartier quite a bit herself. And, yeah. and again, the reason why she had this made for her doll, um, when her estate was auctioned off in New York, the, some of her Cartiers were bringing millions of dollars at, at auction, her Cartier Well, pieces. since the proceeds of this auction will benefit the Bellascardo Foundation, who are providing arts and culture to the California coast, I hope that someone pays a million dollars for this. <laughs> I hope so, to too. To benefit Bellascardo, exactly. because it is well-deserving And we'll talk of more it. about Bellascardo later on and their vision and what that means. I think I want to talk to you now about the uh, phonograph doll and her love of the phonograph doll. And we have several of them um, on display here. She, in the front, about four rows up, there's a little girl, and she's holding a little recording in her hand. All right, and that is um, the Bebe phonograph. The Bebe phonograph came out in 1892, 1893, and it was done in conjunction with Henri Lorel, who invented the phonograph um, in, in Paris, the Paris edition, a great competition between Leroux and Edison at the time. And um, he commissioned Jumeau to create a Bebe that would have a torso that would open so the mechanism could be placed inside and the recordings could play. I have to honestly tell you, in all of my eight million years of cataloging, I've never really heard one that you listen to the recording and said, oh, that's got a good sound to it. Uh, they, they tend to be kind of muffled, but they were doing what they could do, and it was the beginning of recording, and that's such an important history. Um, to all to all of us today, because music has become such a an, so such an easy thing for us, we don't realize how it wasn't available uh, for people, and so this was the really beginning of it. Um, in the in her search for the um, Bebe phonograph, she tried to find ones that had original costumes. Um, some of them were designed. You know how Bebe clothes are; they'll they'll fasten, they'll little have hooks and eyes in the back. But the Bebe phonograph would come with a chemise, such as that one is wearing, that had a little hook at the front and opened up, just like the costume she had made for Bebe Cantatrice, where you could change the recording and have different recordings. So she sent us on a search through her attorney. He would call us and he would say, Madame Terrio, my unnamed client, wishes to find the Russian recordings. And well, first of all, she wanted recordings 12 and 14 in English, and we found those for her, and he was very, very grateful. Although there was one I think we, I think we never found 12. But then the quest came 
the Russian recordings. And we said, well, we've never heard of the Russian recordings. And we were traveling to France a lot at that time and had a lot of contacts, and we put people on the search for the Russian recordings, and everybody just looked at us like, what are you talking about? There's no such thing as Russian recordings. But she persisted. She was absolutely convinced that they, that they existed. And then, when we were doing the French Encyclopedia, when I was working with Francois Taimer and the French Encyclopedia, we had the information about the, I think it was three Bebe phonographs that were presented to the young princesses of Tsar Nicholas II in his 1897, um, when the French president went to um, St. Petersburg in 1897 and presented the princesses with three examples of the Bebe phonograph with Russian recordings. So, aha, there was the proof that at some point they had been made. And I want to show you uh, the box lid because the, we finally found in unpacking all of her dolls and looking at them, and Stuart was traveling, and I called him up and said, Stuart, you can't believe it. And you're the only person I know I could tell this, and they would think I'm not just some batty old lady with some piece of trivia. One of the boxes is listing the recordion, re, Russian recordings on the lid. It was a very exciting find, so I'm, I'm really happy. And one of the baby phonograph dolls that we're selling here is in the original box with the list of the Russian recordings. But no recordings. No Russian recordings. No Russian recordings. <laughs> Florence, I didn't tell you this, but um, recently um, a lot of people know, because I reported in, in my Facebook uh, to doll collectors around the world, my trip to Russia recently, and which I'm just back from two days ago. And uh, while in Moscow uh, at the Doll Art Expo, a collector came up and was showing me pictures of a museum outside of Moscow, which houses some of the last found objects of Tsar Nicholas and the family, the, 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 yeah. last, the last Tsar. And so, and this museum displays and has in it, I counted in the photographs she showed me over 30 or 40 antique dolls. Really? And it's and automatons, a number of different pieces. Wonderful. So the family clearly had a fascination with French dolls and French toys of that time. The, um, the uh, Tsar Nicholas family. Yes. And, um, and all of them are still preserved and now housed in a museum in Russia. Well, I remember at one trip to Paris in the 1980s, someone was telling me that it had just been discovered in, this, in the attics of one of the top Parisian hotels this extraordinary uh, train set that had been made for the family and then they never came back to Paris and had been up there all of these years and that sold at auction it was like 40 years ago it sold it was a it was a really intriguing intriguing story well Florence another area of her collection and again you find all of these sort of um, I don't want to call it fixation, but a fascination with certain categories and one that clearly stands out in the catalog um, and that was a huge part of her life and one that even was written about in Bill Dedman's book, Empty Mansions, and that is her love of bluette. Yes. So talk about that a little bit and how... Well, we... Um, so when I kept finding bluettes, I kept unpacking and finding bluettes, bluettes, but then when I really sat down to start cataloging, realized, I, mean, I realized I didn't have any of really really any early ones. And they mainly were coming from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And then I started reading all of this correspondence that Bill Dudman was kind enough to share with me that she had been writing back and forth to um, one of her French compatriots, one of them who had um, been affiliated with um, uh, Gautier Langaro and had gone on a search for, she wanted to find all of the copies of La Semaine de Suzette, which was the journal that accompanied Bluette starting in 1905. And it's unbelievable. We have them. They're beautifully bound, and they are they cover the years of the history of that doll. We don't have the early dolls, but we have the dolls from that later period with costumes that I've consulted with various authorities, and um, they've never seen never some seen. of them before. But they clearly are original from Gaultier Longaro, according to the correspondence. Um, this person would wait, watch every year for when new things were coming out, and he would immediately say, "I've I've got some for you," and I'm sending them the usual way. We <laughs> yeah. don't we don't know what there, that there's means. There's some <laughs> great stories in the book about the quest for La Semaine Suzette, the copies of them. Uh, as you mentioned, she had one friend, and then she had another friend who was an artist who was also searching all over Paris for them. He even put ads in the papers and went would go to the flea markets. 
And once he wrote a letter to Huguette and said, my quest for you con- continues, madame. Now, this is an acclaimed artist. She has searching around Paris flea markets for yeah. these. But, but wait, so she, uh, he wrote her a letter and stated, madame, I am searching endlessly for you and I want you to know that I've recently gone to church and I've prayed to St. Francis, Francis of Padua Anthony. And St. Anthony of Padua, who is the lost, uh, the patron saint of lost objects, to help me find them. And I thought that was so Well, him, it must beautiful. have been answered because then she, he wrote in another letter, or she wrote, or he wrote in another letter to her. He said, um, well, I found a woman who has many of the missing copies we're looking for, but her price is too high. I'm waiting her out. <laughs> and, then, and then when he finally did find a woman with a number of them, a very touching thing, and where she said, he said, um, I have managed to uh, settle the deal with this woman. Um, part of the requirement, though, she would like one last weekend with, with them to be able to look one more time all through her books. Well, they, they were the history of French childhood in the 1900s. They really were. Yeah. And, you know, like many American collectors look at them and they say, it's such a simple doll. I, I don't understand all of the excitement. You have to take nostalgia into into consideration here and know that that was um, to French children of the 1900s. And the 1900s were a pretty turbulent time in France. Think about that. Um, this doll was a great solace to them. You can actually... By looking at these catalogs, you can trace, and looking at the costumes and how they change, you can trace the, the, the turmoil that Paris and, or France went through at different times during the 1900s, the two world wars, and you know, mm-hmm. the havoc that was done in the country.